Hi everyone and welcome to today's video where we're going to be doing a guide on and explaining the Sikh and Zoroastrian faiths in EU4, specifically how they work now that they got updated in EU4 1.31 Leviathan. Before we begin, consider leaving a like and subscribing if you enjoyed this video. Only 10% of you are subscribed, so it really mean a lot. Let's get started. Let's start off with Zoroastrian. So the Zoroastrian religion is the traditional faith of the old Persian Empire. Zoroastrians are monotheists and they follow the teachings of the prophet of Zoroaster. Zoroastrian has been in decline for centuries and apart from a concentration around the province of Yazd and Damnan, they exist only as minorities in India and Persia and not represented in the game. So as you know there are only two Zoroastrian provinces at the start of the game and no nation is actually Zoroastrian. Those two provinces are Yazd right here which is controlled by the Timurids at the start of the game and the new province Damnan which has been added in 1.31 which is controlled by Gujarat at the start of the game. So the only way to play as a Zoroastrian nation is to basically make a custom nation in one of these provinces or with that religion to release and play as a Zoroastrian nation, for example, as the Timurids, you could release Yazd from this province or convert through rebels since no religion can actually convert to Zoroastrian from this interface right here. So as you can see right now, I've tagged into the nation of Yazd and our official religion is a Zoroastrian. So we can see how it works. So every Zoroastrian nation receives plus 10% trade efficiency and plus two tolerance of the true faith. And every Zoroastrian province receives minus 2% local missionary strength. So that's the same as before, but now we'll look at what has changed in 1.31. So the Zoroastrian religion now works similarly to the Coptic religion. And this is the Zoroastrian faith interface. As you can see, we have rituals up here and holy sites down here. And it does work similarly to the Coptic religion. So the first holy site is Shirvan. That is this province right here. As we can see, it is controlled by the nation of Shirvan at the start of the game. The province is not Zoroastrian and neither is the nation. The second holy site is Damanan, which is controlled by Gujarat at the start of the game. The province itself is Zoroastrian, but it's not controlled by a Zoroastrian nation. The next holy site is Loristan, which is controlled by Fars at the start of the game. The province isn't Zoroastrian and neither is the nation. The fourth holy site is Kiva, which is controlled by Transoxiana at the start of the game and the province is not Zoroastrian and neither is the nation. And the final holy site is Sabzabar, which is controlled by Khorasan at the start of the game and it's not Zoroastrian, the province is not Zoroastrian and neither is the nation. So as you can see, all holy sites are concentrated in the Persia super region except for Damnan, which is in India. Now we get to the rituals or blessings, which there are five of. The first one is Yasha, which gives you yearly corruption, minus 0.03. Then we have Haoma, which gives you local goods produced, plus five percent Naviote which gives you missionary strength plus two percent Mantras which gives you governing capacity plus ten percent and Dakma which gives you construction cost minus five percent now for each holy site you can pick one blessing and you don't have to take them in order and you also don't have to take the holy sites in order but you do of course have to convert them to Zoroastrian now playing as a Zoroastrian nation of course there aren't a lot of Zoroastrian provinces in the world and you will be focusing on converting them so I recommend taking this blessing first Naviote which gives you plus two percent missionary strength. After that I recommend picking the yearly corruption minus 0.03 blessing as your second blessing. By the time you get your third blessing you will have grown quite a bit and you will be needing that extra governing capacity. So I recommend taking Mantras as the third blessing. As your fourth blessing you should take construction cost minus five percent to build all those sweet manufactories and workshops and finally taking the Haoma blessing which gives you plus five percent local goods produced in every province and it will especially help you out after you have been building with the help of this blessing so that's the order of the blessings that you should take them in another important thing to note about the zoroastrian faith is that it does have a monument which can only be used if you're a zoroastrian nation so that's pretty unique and it is located in the province of shirvan which like we said previously it is a holy site as well this is the baku ateshga 
monument. And as we can see, the nation controlling it needs to be Zoroastrian and the province itself has to be Zoroastrian for you to receive the benefits. It does start out at level 1, but when you conquer it, of course, it will drop down to 0. So at tier 1, it gives you plus 2.5% discipline and minus 5% fire damage received. Pretty strong. At tier 2, it gives you plus 2.5% discipline, minus 5% culture conversion cost, and minus 10% fire damage received. Again, very strong. At tier 3, you get plus 5% discipline, minus 10% culture conversion cost, plus 5% land fire damage, and minus 10% fire damage received. Now this monument did used to be a lot more powerful, but it is still very strong, and you should of course focus very heavily on upgrading it to level 3 if you are a Zoroastrian nation, and if you're playing as a Zoroastrian nation. Zoroastrian nations have two unique achievements as well. The first one is rekindling the flames, which requires you to start as a custom Zoroastrian nation with no more than 200 points and a maximum of five provinces. So of course you would start over here in this area probably, or maybe even in Gujarat. And it requires you to take the decision, rekindle the royal fires, which requires you to own these seven different provinces, which are listed here and have the government rank of empire. Once you take this decision, you will get that achievement as a custom nation only, of course. And another achievement has been added added in 1.31 specifically for Zoroastrian nations and you could do it as well along with the previous one so you could do both at once and it is called keep the flame burning and it requires you to as a Zoroastrian nation own all religious centers which are basically these five holy sites and to have the Baku Atejga monument at tier 3. Those two are definitely very fun achievements and I do recommend trying to go for them when playing as a Zoroastrian nation. And now we move on to the Sikh faith. So Sikhism is the faith founded by Guru Nanak around the turn of the 16th century in the Punjab. It's a monotheistic religion and Sikhism was born in an area where Islam and Hinduism mix, but in many ways it's unlike either of them. No province or country actually starts with the Sikh religion though, as you guys will probably know, but it does appear a few decades after the game starts, usually around the 1500s. If you've never played in this region, it usually appears around the same time that the Protestant Reformation does, even though of course they they aren't connected at all. So how does Sikhism show up? So it can appear by event from 1480 onwards in a cluster of up to three provinces generally in this region right here. So one of those three provinces needs to be either Muslim and border a Hindu province or Hindu and border a Muslim province. And it's more likely to appear in Punjabi cultured provinces, specifically in the province of Doab right here. And the event will convert up to three provinces and give each of them religious zeal. Now, since no nation actually has Sikhism in 1444, I've converted Sirhind to Sikh just for the purposes of this video. So as you can see, this is the Sikh interface and each Sikh nation receives plus 10% morale of armies and minus 10% military technology cost, which makes it one of the best military focused religions in EU4. Every Sikh province also receives minus 1% local missionary strength. So what's so unique about Sikh and why is it such an excellent religion, especially militarily? Well, the Sikh religion has the unique mechanic of gurus. So nations following the Sikh faith gain access to events related to the succession of Sikh gurus. And each event for new gurus makes accessible three predetermined teachings, as you can see right here. And you can only choose one of them from each guru and you can only have up to six in total. Selecting a teaching costs 50 monarch power in the respective category. So of course the first one would cost 50 admin points, the second one would cost 50 diplomatic points, and the third one would cost 50 military points. And you can only pick one of these and they will show up in your teachings here as permanent modifiers. You can remove them if you change your mind, but of course you don't get the points back. Now something very important that you do need to know, each teaching that you pick will reduce your missionary strength by 1%. So of course you can take the decision to save the burning world as a Sikh nation, which gives you plus 3% missionary strength. So you can basically start out with 5, but with each of those teachings you get minus 1% if you have up to 6. So that is something to keep in mind. Having all 6 teachings will give you minus 6% missionary strength. Now moving on to the gurus, and like I said, Guru Nanak is the first one, and he is available from when Sikhism spawns all the way up to 15 
39 and he gives us monthly admin power plus one and as we can see here his teachings are minus one national unrest plus five percent production efficiency and minus 2.5 percent regiment costs and we can also see the next guru coming up which is guru angad and he will give us monthly military power plus one now guru angad is available from 15 39 to 1552 and his teachings are minus 2.5 percent mil tech cost plus 10 percent church loyalty or plus 0.5 percent yearly army professionalism a very powerful guru here too with strong military focused ideas the third guru which is guru amar das available from 1552 to 1574 gives us monthly diplomatic power plus one and his teachings are plus five percent tax plus one diplo rep or plus five percent nobles rajputs and martha's loyalty the next guru is guru ram das who is available from 1574 to 1581 and he gives us plus one monthly admin power once again his teachings are plus 0.25 your legitimacy or republican tradition or devotion depending on your government type or 0.5 percent yearly prestige or plus 10 percent global manpower modifier after that we have Guru Arjan who is available from 1581 to 1606. He gives us plus one monthly diplo power and his teachings are plus 10% institution spread, plus 10% religious unity or plus 5% morale of armies. Guru Arjan is once again a very powerful guru. After that we have Guru Hargobind who is available from 1606 to 1644. He gives us plus one monthly mill power and his teachings are once again plus 0.25 yearly legitimacy or devotion or meritocracy depending on your government type, minus 0.025 war exhaustion or plus 2.5% discipline. After that we have Guru Har Rai from 1644 to 1661. His teachings are minus 0.05 yearly corruption, plus 10% improved relations or plus 5% nobles, Rajputs and Martha's loyalty. After that we have Guru Har Krishan from 1661 to 1665. He gives us plus one monthly diplomatic power, plus one monarch admin skill, plus one monarch diplo skill and plus one monarch monarch military skill now this is probably the most powerful guru in the game but it's a real shame that he only lasts for four years so make sure to maximize those monarch points when you do get them after that we have guru tech bahadur and he lasts from 1665 to 1675 giving us plus one monthly admin power plus one missionary plus two tolerance of heretics or plus one hostile attrition after that we have guru gobind singh from 1675 to 1708 giving us minus 10 advisor minus 50% war taxes cost and plus 0.5 yearly army professionalism a very powerful guru once again and finally we have guru garanth sahib from 1708 onwards giving us minus 50% state maintenance and minus 25% regiment drill loss he is the only guru who doesn't give us plus one monthly monarch points and his teachings are minus 10% dev cost plus 10% trade efficiency and plus 50% drill gain modifier now you might have noticed that i listed 11 gurus while there are only six teachings available so of course you can fill these teachings up and then remove them when you get gurus with better teachings but keep in mind that there are 11 gurus so 33 teachings in total and you can only have six of them once a guru goes away and you haven't taken any teaching from him you can't get those back so if you want a teaching from a guru you have to take it while he is active there is a unique achievement for Sikh nations well to be exact for a Sikh nation and that is Sikh pun which requires you to convert to Sikhism and form the nation of Punjab and of course you can even release and play as Punjab or you can start as one of these nations over here convert to Sikhism and form the kingdom of Punjab or which you need admin tech 10 and it is a pretty fun achievement and Punjab has some really really strong military focused ideas paired with the Sikh faith you will be the dominant military power in the world there's also a ton of monuments around India and near India and Southeast Asia which require you to be in the Dharmic religion group to take advantage of them of course Sikh is in the Dharmic religion group along with Hindu so every monument that works for Hindu works for Sikh as well and there are a ton of monuments which you can take advantage of and I definitely very highly recommend starting as one of these nations here and converting to Sikhism if you haven't played as a Sikh nation it's very very fun 
while playing as a Zoroastrian or a Sikh nation, I do highly recommend taking religious ideas for one of your first two idea groups as these faiths will be represented in so few provinces in the world and you will need to convert basically every province that you own. And yes, I do recommend taking religious over humanist just because of the better bonuses and the better long-term stability that it provides. So that's pretty much everything you need to know about the Sikh and Zoroastrian faiths in EU4. If this video gets 250 likes, I'll do a guide for the new Dreamtime religion as well as the updated Totemist mechanics that came with 1.31. If you enjoyed this video, don't hesitate to leave a like and subscribe. Only 10% of you are subscribed, so it really me a lot. And I've also launched channel memberships, so if you want to support the channel with more than subscribing, you can check out the join button down below and join the Discord. The link is in the description. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time with another EU4 video.